Well, good morning to you all. Uh, thank you, for, uh, Professor Williams. Uh, it's great to be here with you and uh, kick off uh, this year's uh, annual lecture uh, series. And uh, it's awesome to have so many of you come and, and uh, listen. And uh, so I, I hope that I can give you something today that will be of value to you uh, in your uh, scholastic career as well as your uh, upcoming vocation. Uh, do we have all of the classes represented here from freshman to senior? Is it all business? So, yeah? All right, so you're all at sort of a different place in your journey. Well, let me just give you a, a little bit of background on myself, and uh, I will uh, try and give some time at the end uh, to have, you know, sort of a Q&A time if you, if you want to ask me some questions. Uh, please feel free to do that. If a question occurs to you, jot it down, uh, hold it to the end. We'll take as many questions as we can. I, I'm not under a particular time bind, but uh, some others or uh, professor may be, I don't know, but I'm, I've got time today. Um, and I also, there'll be a couple times that I'll just kind of ask for some interaction from the group just to keep you from nodding off on me because I know you guys were probably up late studying last night, right? So, um, but about myself. Um, I was born on Turkey Hill, literally, almost literally. Actually, I was born in Lancaster General, but uh, we lived on Turkey Hill. And uh, I grew up at Turkey Hill. It was a family business, and you'll hear a little bit about that. So it's been my entire career, but I've uh, recently retired. I retired at the beginning of August after 33 years full-time and 22 years as president. And uh, I'm working part-time and I'm now the Turkey Hill brand ambassador. And folks might say, well, what's a brand ambassador do? Well, he does things like this. Uh, comes out and speaks to groups. Uh, on Tuesday, I was speaking to a retirement community down in, in Wayne, uh, PA, down near Philadelphia. I also do some traveling. I'll be headed to Shanghai later this year, trying to develop some international business. Uh, so hopefully, what I'm trying to do is do the fun stuff uh, without some of the more difficult stuff after uh, 33 years. I, just some, some personal things. I am married also for 33 years, and I have a son who's 33 years old. That was a big year in my life, 1980. I went to work, I got married, and I had a child. Uh, so I have, I have four children, they're all married, and now I've got six grandchildren, which is just awesome. And I know that someday all of you are going to make <clears throat> grandchildren for your parents. Uh, they're looking forward to it, believe me. Um, I went to uh, both Messiah and Millersville. Uh, don't boo because I went to Messiah. Um, graduated from Millersville with a degree in economics and uh, currently am a, a master's degree candidate at Lancaster Bible College uh, for, for a master's degree in ministry and leadership. And I'm in my final course and hope to graduate in um, December. I did a good bit of my college part-time as I worked, and I've done my master's degree part-time as I worked. So I've uh, folded education and work together and career together and it's been a great thing for me to be able to learn and practice at the same time. But it is a challenge uh, to, to balance both those things. Well, today I entitled my uh, little talk, Cool, Curious, and Crazy, The New Business Fundamentals. And I think you guys might be wired even more than I am to do this in the future, but I do think uh, they hold some clues uh, to how businesses can, see, can succeed in the future. But first we're going to take a look at uh, some Turkey Hill history and then we're going to look at some reasons why or how Turkey Hill is cool, curious and crazy and why we try and do that. And uh, then we'll, we'll finish up with some Q&A. Most people, the most frequent question I get is why would you call a dairy Turkey Hill? It's a strange name for a dairy and I have to agree. But it's simply the fact that the land where the dairy is situated is called Turkey Hill. 
Uh, it's a historic name, this sheepskin deed, dated back to 1768, um, calls this area commonly known by the name of Turkey Hill. So the name goes back prior to the birth of the nation, and uh, we assume Native Americans hunted turkeys there, and the settlers, uh, colonialists, picked up the name and carried it forward, and so that's where we got the name. How many of you are Pennsylvania citizens, Pennsylvanians? Mm, all right, probably 80% anyway. Who can tell me who founded Pennsylvania? William Penn. William Penn, very good. Do you know anything about William Penn? Quaker. He was a Quaker. How about back there? <laughs> yeah, and he, he owned the entire thing. Well, I grew, I, went to, I grew up in Manor Township, where the dairy is located, went to Penn Manor High School. Wasn't until I was probably in my 30s that I realized the reason they called it Manor Township was because it was the piece of land that William Penn had intended for himself, and it was to be his manor. And he was going to keep that land as his, so it was called Penn's Manor, and hence the high school I went to. You thought I learned that piece of history when I was going to Penn Manor, but I didn't. I, I don't have time to talk to you about William Penn, but I want you to know we are the inheritors of an awesome uh, tradition, if you will. William Penn was an outstanding man, and unfortunately we don't hear much about him. But I call him the founder of America. We often talk about in America the, founder, the founding fathers. I call William Penn the founding father. Why do I call him that? Well, up in our state capitol, written around the rotunda, is a, a uh, little quote from William Penn that he says, My God will use this land, this Pennsylvania, to be the seed of a nation, because the nations are in want of a precedent. Now, he predicted in that quote that this would be a country. That was 80 years before the Declaration of Independence. And he was saying Pennsylvania would be the seat of that nation. Where was the first capital of, of the United States? Where? Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Where was the first Supreme Court? Where was the Declaration of Independence signed? Right. Uh, William Penn was called by Thomas Jefferson the greatest lawgiver that ever lived. Have you any idea why? He wrote the Pennsylvania Constitution three times, and it was in the Pennsylvania Constitution that Thomas Jefferson found the principles that he incorporated into the United States Constitution, where separation of church and state was established for one. William Penn's also the inventor of the writ of habeas corpus means you can't be held without a charge. Why do you think he invented that? Anybody know? As a Quaker, he was persecuted by the Church of England because he wasn't a part of the Church of England, and he was incarcerated several times, and he acted his own lawyer, and he invented the writ of habeas corpus, saying, you just can't hold me here without charging me. You've got to bring me to court and charge me. And, of course, he won his freedom several times, and so when he founded Pennsylvania, he wanted this to be a land of religious freedom. And that carried into the whole U.S. Constitution. If you want to know about William Penn, read Seed of a Nation, written by Darrell and Laurie Fields. It's a good book. And that was thrown in there because so many of you are Pennsylvanians and you need to know that. All right. The Fry family lived on Turkey Hill for about eight generations, but three generations ago, I'm third generation, my grandfather... Uh, Armour started Turkey Hill uh, as a processing dairy and began home delivery of milk to the town of Columbia. Started, you know, put some extra milk that he had actually in the back seat of his family car, drove down to the town of Columbia, started knocking on doors saying, will you buy my milk? What was going on in 1931? Great Depression. Ever heard the, the saying that necessity is the mother of invention? Well, there was a lot of necessity in the Great Depression. You could say that the Depression was the mother of necessity. Uh, hard economic times made people creative, and they were looking for a way to make extra money. And so a lot of businesses were started during the Great Depression. And uh, our family was no different. 
This is uh, once it grew a little bit, we actually could have a delivery truck. Uh, this was our, our driver and two of my aunts standing there by our first uh, home delivery truck. A picture of our first dairy. Uh, the first refrigerator was a spring. Um, it was a natural spring after you milk the cow, you put the, the milk in a, in a can, set it down in the spring and that began to cool the product. Humble beginnings for sure. <clears throat> 1947, uh, Armour uh, had tired of the retail business. He wanted to go back to farming. And uh, he took his youngest son on the, on the far right there, for you guys, and uh, said, why don't you stay on the, on the farm with me, which he did. And my cousin, uh, Tom, uh, still runs Fry Dairy Farms today. Uh, the three brothers in the center, he said, I'll sell you the, the milk business, uh, which he did, and they purchased it. And one of the big decisions they made was, uh, they said, well, there's three of us, but we'd like a fourth partner. And they said, we'd like God to be our fourth partner. And they said, in, in return for his partnership with us, we'll give 20% of the company's profits to charity. And so that's what they did. They gave 20% of the company's profits to charity from 1947 to 1985 when the business was sold. 1954, we began the ice cream uh, business, and it also was home delivery. Have you ever seen a Schwann's ice cream truck? That's what they're doing. They're doing home delivery ice cream, and that's the way we started. We stopped home delivery in 1991. So the business uh, declined, and, and we started some other businesses in return. Here's just a couple of pictures of uh, a milk truck at, at the top and an ice cream home delivery truck at the bottom. 1967, uh, we actually partnered with a company named Wawa, which probably many of you have heard of Wawa convenience stores. We actually hired a couple consultants from Wawa, and they came over and they helped us start Turkey Hill Minute Markets. And eventually, one of those consultants became the president of, of Turkey Hill Minute Markets. Uh, those were started uh, as we saw home delivery declining, the rise of supermarkets growing, and our business model was threatened. We had to find another way, and we said, well, we'll go straight to the consumer. And so we had the farm, we had the processing dairy, and we had the retail business, and it was a vertically integrated business. 1969, we started the iced tea and lemonade business. Uh, been in the iced tea business for nearly 50 years. Um, so we're not newcomers to that, even though it seems like the world has just discovered iced tea in the last 10 years. Uh, we've been in a long time. But it started as just a seasonal product. Uh, one day, I, I, I really came to know that this was no longer a seasonal product when uh, during one of the blizzards we had about 10 years ago, my wife is an RN, and uh, they called from the hospital downtown and said, can you guys make it in here because we're short of nurses. We need nurses. Can you make it in? And since I had four-wheel drive, we said, yeah, we can, we can get there. So I was driving her into the hospital, and we drove by a Turkey Hill Minute Market, which had you know snowbanks this high in front of it. And I saw a guy. It's like you know, this is like 7:30 in the morning. I saw a guy climbing over this snowbank with two gallons of tea in his hand. And I'm thinking, you know, it's 7:30 in the morning. There's a blizzard. What is this guy doing? You know that he needs his iced tea that bad. But now, when there's a snowstorm, we've got to send extra tea out to the stores because they just blow it out. You know, it used to be a rush on milk. Now it's a rush on tea. It's become a staple uh, in many people's uh, refrigerators. 1985, we sold to uh, the Kroger Company. I don't have a lot of time to get into that other than to tell you uh, this was an estate planning uh, thing on the part of my father and my uncle. Um, we were a profitable company with absolutely no debt, uh, but we had many family members that were not interested in the business. It was just me and, and my cousin that were interested in the, in the dairy business. Just uh, want to get into this a little bit. That's a little bit about our history, but as you, as you can see, we made a lot of changes along the way. We had to change and keep up with the times. When new technologies came out like pasteurization and homogenization, you had to adapt those or you, or you died. And uh, we purchased a lot of dairies over the years that were doing that. They'd get to where they didn't want to buy that new technology and they decided to stop business 
instead of going forward. Well, this quote, I was reading uh, this fellow's book, Break from the Pack, Oren Harari. Um, his, uh, this quote really hit me. He said, in today's hyper-competitive environment, organizations which break from the pack have these characteristics. They're cool, or they're curious, they're cool, and they're crazy. That might strike you as a little odd at first, but think about it. Think about some of your favorite brands or favorite companies. Uh, who, who do you think's out there that you might say is a cool company or a crazy brand or just name, name one that you think might exemplify being cool, curious, and crazy? Anybody? Uh, Apple. Apple. That's one of the first that comes to mind. Well, they, make, they, they make really cool products, don't they? Yeah. Anybody else? Nike. Nike? Yep, they make uh, very expensive sneakers. People want to own them. Why, right? There's lots of sneakers out there, right? There's lots of computers. But somehow, they make people want these, and there's something more than the rational mind that makes you want them. Is that right? <coughs> something more than the rational mind. Well, this cool, curious, and crazy gets at that thing that's not rational in us. It gets maybe a little deeper into who we are. So at Turkey Hill, we've tried to take this to heart. And uh, one of the curious things that I think uh, is really cool and curious about Turkey Hill is we try and practice what we call team leadership. And this is a picture of our executive team. Uh, I, I put a couple other pictures there. I really love a uh, team of rivals. I love the book. I think it's one of the best management books ever written. Uh, it's also one of the best history books ever written about Abraham Lincoln and how he hired his rivals to be on his cabinet. And uh, they became a strong team because they were strong people, each one of them. Well, I'm going to show you, I'm going to start at the, the back end. I'm going to show you the results of team uh, leadership, and then I'm going to talk about a little bit of how it looks and, and how it works. In 1991, when I became president, we were about $68 million company. Today, we're $320 million and growing, and uh, we've tripled the workforce. We were producing about 16 million quarts of drinks. Today, that's $236 million. Uh, milk produced increased, but not as significantly. Uh, ice cream production, about 46 million quarts, quart equivalents and today about 115 million. A lot of growth resulted. We went from those blue states, about four states, to all the way across the country, including Alaska. We don't sell products in Hawaii that we know of. We're in about 50% of the supermarkets across the United States today. And we're in about seven countries, so we are doing some exporting of product. That in, that in itself is uh, a pretty uh, curious endeavor. Resulting in the fourth leading premium ice cream brand in the nation and the number one refrigerated iced tea. In fact, I'd say we invented that category. Uh, when IRI and Nielsen began to uh, look at syndicated data for this category, they hadn't recognized it as a category until about 15 years ago. When they did, we were we were the number one brand in that category by a wide margin. We really sort of created this fresh iced tea business. Well, why team leadership? Here's some, what some other folks think about it. Today's world requires a different leadership style, moving more into the collaboration and teamwork. As John Chambers, uh, CEO of uh, Cisco. To solve big problems. To quote one of our presidents, there's no problem we cannot solve together, and very few we can solve by ourselves. Just stop and think, that, think about that a little bit. How often do we try and solve problems on our own? It's pretty, pretty native to us to want to solve our own problems and think we can solve our own problems. When, in fact, uh, sometimes that's very difficult and we need help. And so this is really sound advice. We need other people if we're going to solve problems, especially large problems. 
How many of you have heard the word servant leadership in any of your studies here, any of your journey? <coughs> so you want to make over here? No? Haven't heard about that, that term of servant leadership? Well, that's been a, a real buzzword among churches, but it didn't come from churches. It came from a businessman named Robert Greenleaf, who wrote the book Servant Leadership in 1978. <laughs> and it's a classic, and I recommend it as reading. Um, I actually found the book by accident in my mother's bookshelf. Somebody had given it to her, and I read it. Uh, didn't know it was a classic when I read it. Uh, later came to find, oh, that's where all this comes from. But he talked about team leadership, and he talked about the, the head of an organization being the primus, uh, not the chief, not somebody up here and everybody else down here. He said the leader of an organization should be on the same level as his team, and he has a specific role to be a facilitator or a convener, but he's not the chief. Um, he's, the, he's the first among equals, and in my team, when I was the president of the company, I looked at them and said, they're just as valuable, they're just as skilled as I am. I play a specific role. I'm not above them. Uh, and that, there's a lot, it's, it's, um, it, it's kind of like a, uh, a um, I, I don't want to say oxymoron, but that's not, a, a paradox. It's a paradox in that leadership is, you know, it's hard to think about leadership except for some person out front leading. And so, in a sense, that person is out on front, but on the other hand, they are one of the team. And they have to balance, really, leading and supporting in a way. They have to balance that paradox because it's a very powerful thing. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of powerful things in life are not easy or simple. They are paradoxical. You have to learn how to balance that. So what's a team leader like? He's to, uh, to collaborative team members, completing one another is more important than competing with one another. We're a highly competitive society. We compete with each other all, all the time. And we really actually prize that attribute in people. Uh, just look at our sports teams. We, we prize the competitive spirit in America. But there's another spirit that I think needs to be high, prized more highly in business, and that's the collaborative one. That means we're here to help each other. We're here to work together to get something done, and we're less concerned about uh, who gets the credit and more concerned about do we solve the problem. Uh, Ken Gangle on uh, leadership. Above all, they exercise leadership as servants and stewards. Uh, sharing authority with their followers, get that, sharing authority with their followers, and affirming that leadership is primarily ministry to others. Our, our work, no matter what it is, whether you're a leader or you know, a nurse or uh, whatever profession you pick, it is a ministry to other people. You're serving other people. Modeling for others and mutual membership with others. Uh, so it's collaborative, and it's a shared authority, shared decision-making, shared leadership. This is one of my favorite leadership uh, verses from Scripture. And yes, I'm one of those uh, Crow Magnum men that still thinks the Bible has something to say about leadership in today's uh, society, in today's culture. It says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each one of you should not look only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Who knows what the two qualities of a level five leader, leader is from Jim Collins? Can you read that book, Good to Great? You haven't had to read Good to Great? Next semester. Next semester. It's a great book. Jim Collins wrote a book called Good to Great, and he identified two characteristics of a level five leader, which in his, uh, in his research is the highest level of leadership. Humility and fierce resolve. Humility and fierce resolve. A humble person who is fiercely dedicated to the outcome are the most powerful, successful leaders. And he studied leaders for 15 years prior to coming to that conclusion and that after uh, a lifetime of study. 
Humility is very important, and humility is a part of seeing yourself as one among equals, not one as the chief over others. You see how important humility might be in a leadership model. Here's a very successful company, Toyota's, uh, Toyota. Their assumption is that if you make teamwork the foundation of the company, individual performers will give their hearts and souls to make a company successful. So they think teamwork is going to engage associates. If you're giving them an opportunity to be in a, in a team, they're going to engage in the success of the company. Back to Oren here, he says, to improve your odds of truly breaking from the pack in a sustained way, you should consider going a step up to a higher cause. Being cool, curious, and crazy helps people connect with your mission and brand. It's going to a, something that's a little higher in nature than just making profit. It's about doing something in the world that's unique, that's powerful, probably will make a profit, but there's a higher goal than profit. You want to touch people's hearts. Um, when you can engage your team, you have aligned team members, and you've motiv te motivated team members, make engaged team members. By aligned, we mean all in their, in their minds, they know which direction we're going as a company. We huddled, we called the play, we're aligned. We come up to the line of scrimmage, ready for action, we're aligned, we know what the play is. But if you're there and your heart's not in it, how hard are you going to run the receiving route? How hard are you going to block uh, for, the, for the running back? Are you going to sacrifice your body to protect your quarterback? You might have known what the play was, but is your heart really in it? That's what motivation is. Motivation comes from the heart. Knowledge of what we're going to do comes from the mind. Motivation comes from the heart. And if you're a consumer, motivation to buy comes from the heart. You've thought about things, but you buy an Apple or you buy a Nike and you pay that extra buck because you're really, you know, they've done something that connected with your passions or what you think about yourself. And the same for your employees. If they know what to do and they're motivated to do it, you've got an engaged workforce and they're going to be helping you make the company successful. Well, why do I think team leadership is curious? It's counterculture. Countercultural. It's others first, not me first. I tell a little story about my uh, father and my uncle. When they bought the business, they paid themselves $25 a week. They paid their employees $50 a week. So they put others first and themselves second. Well, you know what? The business eventually took care of the owners too. But they put others first. And when the business could, they paid themselves. They put themselves second. That's how it plays out. Team leadership engages the head. If you're there as a team, making the decision together, shared decision-making, remember? Shared decision-making, then their heads are engaged in the process. And if you have a part in the decision, and you're sharing that decision-making, that engages your heart, because you've got something of yourself vested in this, which means you're going to work hard for the success of the company. It also gives meaning and purpose to our work. It's transformative. Um, when we have this kind of leadership model, it makes people who work at your company really feel like it matters, not just going through the motions for a paycheck. What they're doing really matters, and that means a lot to people. Well, how is, how is Turkey Hill trying to be cool? Well, we found that one of the fastest ways uh, to a fan's heart is through their favorite team's ice cream. Um, they're passionate about their team, right? You probably have some teams you're passionate about. Uh, we make a Blue Jay uh, ice cream. Um, we found that this connects emotionally with consumers. They don't have, I don't need to give them any other reason to buy. It's Philly's ice cream. They're going to buy it. We also do some crazy flavors. Try a lot of different things like baklava or double dunker which I always like to describe Double Dunker as it's chocolate chip cookie dough meets cookies and cream in a mocha ice cream. If you haven't tried that one, you gotta try that one. Of course, other cool things are, well, some people like things very simplistic. 
You know, they like short words and short ingredient lists, and so we have the all-natural ice cream for those. We have the all-natural lemonades and the sun-brewed tea for those who like it simple and pure. And then we have the really wild flavors like black tea with cherry pomegranate or green tea with wild berry and so forth. These flavor, everybody has, seems to have a favorite flavor of Turkey Hill ice cream or a favorite flavor of Turkey Hill tea. And those flavors uh, attract people. We also do some things that are a little more radical. Uh, how many of you have ever gone across the Route 30 bridge to York? Uh, a few of you. Have you looked down the river and seen the turbines? You yeah. have. Then you've seen Turkey Hill, because that's where our plan is located. Uh, these two turbines, uh, we did not build them, uh, but we're the sole customer. Uh, we have a long-term contract to, to buy the electric, and they supply about 25% of the electric of our company. And, uh, of course, it's a green energy. Uh, Pennsylvania Power and Light and Lancaster County Solid Waste partnered together to build them, about $10.5 million to build them. They're about 280 feet tall and each one of those blades is 130 feet long. Uh, immense structures, uh, if you ever get a chance to see them do so. There they are with a view of the, the river off of Turkey Hill. And uh, as I said, supplying about 25% of our, our power at the plant. Uh, we put a little insignia on our packaging <clears throat> that says 25% wind powered dairy. Now here's another thing that we did that's really connected with a lot of people. Uh, we started the Turkey Hill Experience, and it truly was crazy. Uh, this site uh, was located in the town of Columbia where I said our business started doing home delivery. Uh, this was an old silk mill that actually somebody had started to tear down and uh, then left it, and for 25 years it sat there vacant. The back part of that building had no roof, no floors. The front part was just in total decay. Most of the windows were broken out, and it was a huge eyesore, a brownfield in the middle of town of Columbia, which was struggling economically. Um, we got the idea that we should put a plant tour experience there for people, or if you will, if you've been to Hershey Chocolate World, uh, a similar kind of thing, although I'll say better, um, in the town of Columbia, because we had we'd gotten lots of calls from people that wanted to do plant tours, but we couldn't give plant tours. And uh, we looked at this as an opportunity to do something really nice for the, com uh, the community <laughs> and, and really something very good for our uh, brand enthusiasts and consumers um, at large. We spent about seven and a half million dollars on this site in partnership with um, a contractor who, who put additional money in for some areas that he rents out. Uh, and transformed this site and made it into an economic engine in a town uh, that really, really needed it. And we cleaned it up for uh, groundbreaking, and this is what it looks like today. The Turkey Hill Experience and, and Taste Lab. Have any of you been there? <coughs> Couple. They're going, they're going into spring. They're going into spring. All right. Uh, trust me, you will enjoy it. Uh, this is just some pictures of the inside. Uh, this barn, fabricated by our own uh, fabrication team. You go in and uh, you can create your own Turkey Hill flavor online uh, and then create your own ice cream package to go around that flavor and then you shoot your own commercial. We record you and video you and then you can take that commercial and put it out on your Facebook page or your Twitter account or whatever so other people can see what you did. You can find out what your tea personality is. And you can create your own flavor. So if you didn't use mustard and soy sauce when you made your flavor online, you can go into the taste lab and actually use, you know, there's a whole bank of mix-ins and uh, sauces, caramels and fudges and flavorings. You can actually use the eyedroppers to put your flavoring in the ice cream and mix it up and then harden it while you get a little bit of education on how you make ice cream. Uh, it's really an awesome experience. Uh, we have about 100,000 visitors uh, coming there each year, and uh, I encourage you to do it. Um, but these things, we, we do looking for 
what is there a way we can help the community? We were advised by uh, some uh, consultants that we hired that we should go out and do a greenfield project. Well, we support um, farmland preservation initiatives, the Nature Conservancy. You know, it really was not on brand for us to do that. We found a brownfield. It maybe was not the best or the cheapest location, but we felt better about making something uh, better than it was than taking a nice green field and turning it into a parking lot. Well, giving is cool too. I told you that um, what my father and my uncle's commitment was to giving. Uh, Turkey Hill continues that tradition, but so also does Kroger. It was voted the most generous company uh, by Forbes magazine in America in 2011. Um, Kroger's a Fortune 50 company with over 300,000 employees. Uh, huge company and to be recognized as such a generous company was uh, really awesome. So I'm running out of time here and I'm trying uh, just a few things to share with you uh, and then we can go into some q and A. I I'm going to share with you our mission statement which is to build a brand that people can trust. A couple of important words in there. One of them is brand. Uh, a brand is simply, to me, it's our name, obviously, but it's our reputation. It's the reputation behind the name. That's what brand power is. Apple has a reputation. Nike has a reputation for the best sneakers. And Apple for the most creative computers. Um, we have a reputation, too. And it, I'd argue it's the only thing that Turkey Hill owns exclusively. We own that name, and we own that reputation. Um, Everything else, people can make ice cream that tastes like ours. They can make tea that tastes like ours. You know, they can do everything we're doing. They can hire the people that we've hired. You know, they can take those, they can learn, they can use the same technology. What they can't do is they can't take my Turkey Hill name from me and my reputation. Who's the one that can take the reputation away? We're the only ones that can take our own reputation away. Just like you, your name, it's your brand. You have a reputation. Are you building that brand? Or are you tearing that brand down? You can think about it, it's like the only thing you own. You're gonna be a brand. <laughs> you're gonna walk into an employer someday and you're gonna present your brand on a resume. It's gonna be your reputation. Um, very important in our business to protect, preserve, and build the brand and people come to trust that brand. That's the other very important word. People are looking for companies they can trust. They're looking for companies that aren't taking them across, that can be counted on to keep their commitments, can be counted on to be good citizens in the community. So those, that is our mission. Those are the things we try and do. I'm often asked by people what makes Turkey Hill successful, and I say, well, the keys to our success are our enduring principles. Other people call them core values. But I like to call them enduring principles because I get sometimes sick of change. I get sick of the high-paced change in my life. And I like to be reminded, be reminded that some things don't and shouldn't change. And to me, these were elements that were present when Armour started the business 82 years ago. They are the reason why we have endured for 82 years. These principles have endured the test of time, if you will. And 82 years from now, if we're st still a successful company, these will still have to be present. You need to treat all people with fairness and respect. So respect, respecting people, it's, you know, basic. Uh, practicing honesty and integrity. And integrity me means you say you're going to do something, you do it. It's keeping your commitments, whether it's to a vendor, a customer, or a, uh, an associate. Uh, a lot of businesses operate this way. We'll do anything for a customer, and we will do anything to a vendor. All I can tell you is that's wrong, and it's not a way to run a successful business. We work, we work with integrity with our vendors and our customers, and consequently, we have vendors that are enthusiastic about our business, and they support our business, and they help our business. I actually heard from one of them just prior to this session that they really like our company, and they supply a service to our company. They're not my customer. 
or supplier. Produce and sell quality, wholesome products. I like to tell a little story that, you know, when I was about your age, I'd be standing in the kitchen waiting for my mom to get dinner on the table. And she'd see me there hovering around and she'd say, would you make yourself useful? Did you ever hear that line? Would you make yourself useful? Which meant I should do something. If I wanted to eat, you know, I could help. I could set the table or something. Well, it's the same thing in business. If we make ourselves useful, people will find that they want to buy something from us because we're providing something they need. And then serve our customers as we would like to be served. The golden rule. Um, these things are basic. They're not new news to anybody. I think what's different in Turkey Hill, at Turkey Hill from other places is that we try and live them out. We hold ourselves accountable to them. Uh, we recognize though, and we tell our associates, there's no perfect day at Turkey Hill Dairy. There's no perfect day. There's no day that we're perfect at this. But we don't use that as an excuse to just let it slide downhill. You know, you fail, you get back up, you try and do it better again, do it better again. And you can read the front pages of newspapers about businesses that have failed, and I can pretty well guarantee you they violated one of these. They may have had it originally. They may be a 100-year-old company. They used to operate by this, and then they stopped, and that company eventually destroyed itself and was shipwrecked. I would also offer one more thing to you. These can be your keys to success. When you're building your brand reputation, Show people respect, be a person of integrity, produce something of quality, or be willing to serve another person. You will find success. They're the keys to your success. Well, I think Turkey Hill is a cool, curious, and crazy because it's an authentic place with over 80 years of history. We can't hide from our reputation. Uh, after 82 years, we haven't been pulling the wool over people's eyes. We are who we say we are. Uh, it's a creative company with some awesome products. We like to create new flavors, new products. Um, and it's genuine and it's caring for its community and its associates. Um, skip that page. What I think that does is I think it engages our employees in who Turkey Hill is. They work hard for Turkey Hill. It engages our customers. They like those attributes about us. As I said, it engages our suppliers as well. We honor our 82 years of history by practicing our enduring principles. But we're relevant to the present by being cool, curious, and crazy. So we're always doing new things. We drive giant cows around that are 13 feet tall. And we dress them up with red socks on them when we're going up to Boston. And we put longhorns on them when we're going to Texas. She's been in a, she's been in a yacht regatta on Three Rivers, uh, at Three Rivers Stadium. Um, you know, we'll, we'll do creative things. We're in you know, all the social media, the Facebook, the Twitter, the blogs. Uh, we, we stay relevant, but we also honor our history. So with that, we have at least 10 minutes. Uh, and more, I guess, if, if it's permitted. But any questions, comments, <coughs> thoughts? Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, I'm an associate of one of the Turkey Hill Minute Marks. And okay. you mentioned about the guy climbing over the pile of snow with ski down on his feet. That is still today. People mm. coming with, with stormy and flooding out to just get clean ice cream. And mm. they will go to any of my factories that are open. So your product is definitely favored here in the area. Yeah. Doesn't say much for their eating habits. They should probably buy the milk, but yeah, they buy tea and ice cream and that's gonna get them through the storm. <laughs> yeah. Any other? Yeah, back here and then we're, go ahead. Uh, my, my cousin left probably 10, 10 years or so. Uh, we worked together for quite a while and then he left. But I have actually three of my three sons work there. Uh, and there's some other more distant relatives. Um, but yeah, my three sons, I have one in sales and one in accounting and one in uh, R&D and uh, procurement. 
So there's still family involved there. And ours is not the only family. There's other multi-generational families involved at Turkey Hill, which is pretty neat too. Other people own it like it's their own. And uh, so oh, and there was another question here. Good question. Uh, I think one of the important things is that uh, the leaders uh, share credit when they're successful and they take the blame uh, when we're not successful. I've tried to do that. Um, I, I think that's a huge contributor. There's uh, no uh, substitute for spending some time together. Uh, we spend at least one full day together each month uh, which I think is really valuable, and I think everybody looks forward to that. Some meetings people really are, you know, they don't want to go to. They're really boring. And, but we have a lot of fun in those meetings. We have a lot of laughs in those meetings. So I think humor uh, has helped our, uh, our, our morale or our um, working together. Um, I think, um, you know, you express caring. Um, on an individual basis, you know, when things happen in their family or uh, to themselves, um, they uh, notice if you go to the hospital or you go to the funeral or whatever. I think those are important that we care for each other as people. Um, I was just, uh, I had one that just popped out of my mind. Um, anybody caring for individuals? Well, maybe it'll come back to me. Sorry, but I'll give you that. I saw another hand. Yeah. What's your favorite time with your dog? Favorite? Favorite time with your dog. <laughs> um, we were talking about that earlier, weren't we? Um, eating ice cream. <laughs> I, I really enjoyed the creative part. Oh, and don't let me lose that thought. Shared decision making is what I wanted to come back and talk to you. Um, Allowing people to n not just, well, allowing people to express their opinion. If they don't express their opinion about what, you know, about the issue, asking them what their opinion is, those are powerful. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of good reasons to get buy-in on a decision, but there's, you can't help but build the team uh, esprit de corps when you're asking them to have their say in a decision. All right, now, back to... <laughs> Back to my favorite part. The creative process was always a lot of fun. Uh, I, I enjoyed uh, the strategy piece um, a lot and enjoyed our uh, strategic sessions. I, but in the end, uh, people are what matter. Uh, their, their people are going to be the most painful part of business. They're also going to be the best part of business. And um, But over time what happens is you remember the good people and the, and the nice people and the people you've grown to be friends with and you sort of forget some of those tougher times. So people will be what endures uh, in, in, uh, from my career. You know, you remember the things you accomplished together, uh, but the people that you were involved with. So. And way back and then to this one. Yeah, I was a very unusual creature. At about six years old, I, I made a career decision. I said, I wanted to be president of Turkey Hill Dairy. At the time, my uncle was the president. Um, <clears throat> by the time I was 31, it happened. Um, there were many times along the way I didn't know whether a six-year-old had enough wisdom to decide whether or not that was a good idea. Uh, but yeah, I knew very early. Um, <coughs> Which is very unusual. I, you know, I sort of had that uh, course correction, but or that set direction. I think it's partly why I'm in a mid-life course correction right now, uh, at a pretty young age, because I started very young, and um, just that's just always what I wanted to do. My kids, I wouldn't. They've never expressed that 
it was their heart's desire to do this. Uh, I never thought I encouraged them to be there, but they're there. Uh, so I think some of them are still finding their way, though. So I, it happens different ways for different people. Don't be worried if you don't know for sure what you want to do, I'd say, at this point. So, yeah, we had another. Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, and we have taste panels all the time, and uh, you would uh, frequently, particularly with the iced teas, you would see me uh, mixing this flavor and this flavor. We'd have two flavors. I said, what, you know, what happens if we put them together you know, and try them? So, yeah, I've been involved in that, and there's a lot of people involved with it. We get ideas from uh, flavor houses, suppliers, uh, but from consumers from associates. Uh, we, made a, we made an ice cream flavor called uh, Liberty, ice, Liberty uh, Mint, uh, which came from one of our associates. She was up seeing the Statue of Liberty and she and a security guard talked about, you guys ought to have an ice cream uh, after the Statue of Liberty. So that came from an associate. So. What's your favorite? Well, my favorite is uh, Probably the all natural, we've only made it, for a while it was a regular flavor, but now it's only a, a limited edition. It's the chocolate, half chocolate and half butter almond. That's a fantastic combination in my book. Doesn't get any better than that. Well, I saw two here. We'll take two and then we'll, so here and then back. What's that? Uh, my memory of that is, uh, I, I was not working there when it started, but there was a salesperson from a flavor company. Uh, <laughs> and he actually drove a big RV, and every time he'd come out, he'd draw his whole house with him. Uh, he'd come call on us in an RV. I think his name was John Biggs. And that guy went to every dairy in Pennsylvania and sold them on the idea of the how to make iced tea, which is why Rudders and, and uh, Wawa and Clover and every dairy in Pennsylvania sells iced tea. And I look at that guy's life and I say, there's a guy that made a difference. <laughs> I don't know that it matters, you know, um, existentially, but he made a difference in what we eat and drink today. One guy in an RV who was intentional about what he was going to do. And I, I suspect he came with the idea, and it was a good idea because... We could pasteurize it in the same pasteurizer, bottle it on the same filler, store it in the same refrigerator, ship it on the same truck, and sell it in the same store. It didn't cost us any capital to make it uh, as milk. So it's good. Yeah, we don't keep a, a rough or a, a rigid count on them, but I'd say there's about 75. Uh, some of those are only available in the institutional side for dip shops, like a cotton candy or flavors like that. But when you start adding up the frozen yogurts, the no sugar additives, and the sherbets and ice creams, there's a lot of them. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs>